Welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show, I'm your host Stephen Grant and this video we're breaking down Moon Knight Episode 5. Cheers for that Stevie G, hope nothing happens to you as that would weigh on my heart quite a lot. But I'm not a rapper. Now the episode has just dropped and there's a ton of easter eggs, hidden details and things you missed in it that we're going to be breaking down in this spoiler filled recap. It's somewhat of a trip down memory lane that fills in some of the blanks about the character and hopefully with us talking about what happens in the comics, you should start to get more of an appreciation for what's going on in the show. We're almost at the end so we'd massively appreciate the thumbs up and also don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss all our prediction videos and breakdown of the final episode. Without the way, thank you for clicking this. Now let's get into Moon Knight Episode 5. Ok so last week saw Mark coming to in a psychiatric hospital that was filled with things from throughout the season. After coming across Steven in a sarcophagus, we got a hint that there was a Jake Lockley locklied up in one and we met the goddess Tarouette. I love the subtle little details as they scream because Steven seemed terrified but if you look at his hand, he's actually trying to wave back. Now her appearance was first hinted at all the way back in episode 1 when Donna brought her up to Steven. Bring those hippos up here will you? Yeah sure. Tarouette it. The hippo. Goddess Tarouette it. Anyway, the episode is titled Asylum and this of course has many meanings. Not only does it typically pertain to a hospital like the one we get in this episode, but it's also a word used to describe when someone is put under protection. This of course ties in with Steven, who's even referred to as a stress ball throughout the episode. Now we begin with a flashback to Mark screaming and also his mother saying that it's all his fault. There's a slight waterfall effect of this which could be linking back to the HR desk from episode 2. This is later revealed to be the apparent death of Mark's brother, but we'll talk later on about how the character could return. From here we seemingly pick up where we left off but Harrow pulls Mark back into the room by saying that it's all a fantasy and that he has difficulty grasping what's happening with reality. This is such a mind f and I love the way that the show constantly keeps tricking us as to what's going on. We learn this is all located in Putnam which also pulls directly from the comics. Now Harrow of course denies shooting Mark and it is possible that the reason he shot him two times was to kill both Mark and Steven. He says that he refuses to look within, which this episode is very much about. Now the ending of 4 in this opening have slight nods to movies like Shutter Island and 12 Monkeys. The latter featured Bruce Willis as a time traveller who went back to the 90s to stop a killer virus from being released that meant everyone would have to sit in the house all day watching Tiger King. Yay. However, he went back too far and after arriving in the early part of the decade, he was arrested and put into an insane asylum. It was difficult to tell for about the first hour of the film whether he was really a time traveller or just imagining the whole thing, which I think this episode could definitely also be doing. Now earlier in the week I made a video discussing about how there were several clues in the season that showed he'd been in the asylum the entire time. This seemingly gets debunked in this entry and we learned that last week as many suspected, it was just his mind trying to piece things together. Now there are mentions of this being carried out when people are trying to organise their thoughts and thus they create a fake reality for the entire thing. Harrow wants Mark to break down the walls between him and Steven and he very much acts as a psychiatrist actually trying to help him. I love the way it kind of leaves things up in the air a bit and you could genuinely look at things like they're all in his mind. Now upon being injected he returns back to the corridor with Steven and Tarouette which is pretty damning. I love it when a show does something like this and just in the same way that we can see this all really playing out, you could argue it's just a fantasy that Mark is using to deal with his psychosis. Now throughout the season itself, Harrow has acted as somewhat of a psychiatrist to not only Mark but also Layla. Huge shout out to David Lee who pointed out how, when Stephen met Harrow, that it was basically what happens when a patient is introduced to a new care facility. He was handcuffed by the orderlies, taken in and then let go when he met the doctor, who then slowly walked him through the compound appearing as a friend. There were people sat on meditation pillows, several watching calming nature videos and Harrow also took Stephen to get some food from the same line that everyone else was eating from. This is done in hospitals to show that the food is safe to eat and when Layla arrived, things got even crazier. We now know Harrow's office was also the room that Steven went up to in episode 2 and it features the exact same columns in recess that that place does. Beyond that there's also the Ennead who work much in the same way that a council at a hospital does too. Whenever a patient accuses a doctor of abuse and neglect, they're called before a group of doctors much like what we saw in episode 3. Now 9 times out of 10, the doctor is believed over the patient who tends to bring up their mental illness to downplay what's going on. I'm going to talk about my theories for the finale next week but I just wanted to drop this in first to highlight it and I appreciate you sitting through the section if you've seen us mention it about 50 times in other videos that we've done this week. Much appreciated, you're the best. See you chump. So going off this conversation, you can kind of see that Mark might be imagining the entire thing 
especially with the jumping back and forth, or I could just be sat in my own hospital right now, refusing to let go of a fan theory, my beautiful, beautiful fan theory. Anyway, the injection sets him off again, and we meet the goddess who says they're dead. As Shakira said, hippos don't lie. Dear, dear me, that's a bad one. And she introduces herself. She also informs them that they're in Duat, the underworld in Egyptian mythology. There's also the mention of the ancestral plane from Black Panther, which she calls gorgeous. She very much repeats notions of what Harrow said and informs them that it's too difficult for the human mind to perceive, so things are put in place to resemble a familiar environment. Going down the rabbit hole that this is all real, there have been several things in the series that of course popped him in the hospital, and I totally forgot to mention that Donna said this in episode 1. Listen, if you don't stop nattering at me, I swear I'll shove you in a sarcophagus. Stephen, of course, was also found in a sarcophagus, so hey, it's all connected, hey, eh, Conchue? I thought my jokes were bad. Now, Taroe is the goddess of fertility and also childbirth. In mythology, she married the god of luck and has seen over many children and women. Interestingly, she was also charged with guiding souls of people that died, which kind of ties into what's going on here. There's lots of things that call back to ancient Egyptian mythology, and typically, people used to believe that when one died that their heart would be weighed in the afterlife. If they were bad, then they'd get eaten by the crocodile god Amit, and this also ties in why Harrow has the scales to do as well. The Egyptians believed that death was not the end, and that it was simply a transition into another part of an eternal journey. The Field of Reeds was very much the idealised version of someone's life, that was a paradise they gained access to after passing through the Hall of Truth. This episode is all about balancing the scales, but unfortunately, by the end, that means that Stephen has to die. Granted, granted, eh? And uh, I must admit, I had some tears in my eyes as this moment played out. I've really grown fond of the guy over the last five weeks, and I hope this isn't the end. Now, it does sort of follow similar beats to the end of Loki episode 5, when the titular character was also seemingly killed. Though we don't get a post credit scene, I do think Steven will be back, as there's not really a way for a personality to die in someone's mind. Typically in DID, alters end up either merging or going dormant, which I can kind of see happening here. This, however, also leaves the door open for Jake Lockley, who gets hinted at in the entry again. We've had several clues to him throughout the season, and with him being more of a killer than Mark and Steven, the former may turn to him in order to help. Now, Jake was never really an assassin in the comics, but Steven was never really a bumbling cockney either. So much in the same way that they've changed Steven up, they could change Jake up too and make him a hitman or something that's going to be a very valuable asset. Mark is probably going to get freed by Konshu, who we get lip service to being possibly freed by Layla. In the comics, he's brought Mark back to life at several points, but we'll talk about that later in the video. Now, I forgot to point out last week, but notice how Mark is wearing light colours, whereas Steven is wearing dark. The pair are somewhat opposites to each other, which is reflected in this bit of costume design. The show has done a really good job of tying in the clothes with the characters and their personalities, and the series has been laced with Mark slash Steven wearing white hoodies at several points. Now, Steven also wore this top in episode 1, and typically, darkness of course represents death, whereas white represents light, potentially foreshadowing the outcome of this entry. Or potentially, it's a reach anyway. After trying to rationalise the situation, Mark makes it even worse by opening the doorway to reveal where they really are. This is a giant boat riding through the dunes, surrounded by the dead. The ancient Egyptians did believe that when they died, they'd be ferried across the river Styx by Sharon, so this is sort of riffing on that. Now this boat of course appeared in Steven's fish tank all the way back in the first episode. It adds a really trippy aesthetic to the whole thing, and it also pulls from the comics. Moon Knight has never actually ridden one of these to the best of my knowledge, however it did show up in the heroic age Prince of Power with Loki and Thor. The pair ended up climbing aboard it to get a sarcophagus, which might have inspired the show. Now this whole episode is based massively on the Jeff Lemire run, which seemingly takes place in an asylum before it's revealed to be the other void. It's a book we've milked more than Squid Game videos, but if this is your first time watching one of our breakdowns, then I think we kind of have to go over it. A huge shout out to our editor Matt, who got all of the bingo numbers from last week and found a pretty cool easter egg with them. Crawley called out all the numbers in the background of the scene, and if you added these up, it took you to 174. The Marvel Legacy numbering started at issue 188, and if we took a step back to what would be issue 174, we ended up with Lemire issue 1, aka the Asylum Story. Now, the first part of the book deals with Mark in Mercy Hospital for the Mentally Ill, which he's apparently been in since he was 12. Overseen by Dr. Emmett, he says he's been there most of his life, and that the entire Moon Knight character is all a fantasy. This is backed up by the characters that join him there, such as Crawley and also Marlene. Now, Marlene was the love interest for Mark in the comics, and we had it confirmed earlier in the week by Mohamed Diab, 
that she was originally in the script for the show. However, he pushed for her to be changed to an Egyptian character and after some alterations to the backstory, Layla was born. Now Mark dreamed he was dying and he had a vision of Conchu, who told him this was all an illusion inside a vessel called the Other Void that existed outside of time and space. It was revealed Emmett was actually Omit and her orderlies Bobby and Billy were in fact jackals. Mark ended up dressing himself in bed sheets and pillowcases and along with the other people from his life, he escaped into the basement of the hospital. From here he ran into mummies and after he made it past this, his personalities all split and they all kind of went off into their own adventures. Steven was a movie producer who was working on the set for a production of Moon Knight which featured both him and also Midnight Man. Jake Lockley was a cabbie who was suspected of murder, there was also a space pilot called Moon Knight and we jump from scenario to scenario throughout the book, seeing things from their perspective as we unraveled the mystery. Now though Omit took the blame for it, in the end it was revealed it was actually Conchu who created the entire scenario because he wanted to break Mark's mind so that he could take over his body. We jumped into his past and learned more about his childhood, namely how he created his imaginary friend Steven who helped him through things when they got tough. Now this is something that sort of happens in the episode but on top of it, the comics reveal that Conchu had actually been there his entire life and that he wasn't just someone who popped up when Mark made the deal with him. In the issue in which he spent a lot of time with Mark's father, Conchu actually said that he was his real dad and we're gonna have to get on the Maury show for that. Should have used a con dom, eh? Con shoe dom, eh? Oh wait, oh wait, there's kids watching. Uh, ignore what I said there. Now he'd constructed, eh? Clean that. Everything around him to grab his body and over the years he'd slowly chipped away at his mind in order to take over him. The book ended with all the personalities coming together and joined as one, they finally killed Conchu. Now I don't think this will happen in the show as Conchu seems more like he's trying to stop Omit, but it is an important twist in the comics to bear in mind. Now along with Mark's childhood, the book also featured sections about his transformation into Moon Knight which we'll get into in just a bit. Now Tarawet pulls their heart out, which this episode did to me too, and they appear almost like marble. On the scales they have a chaotic rocking back and forth motion, much like what happened with Harrow's tattoo in episode 1. The scales themselves didn't feature in the Jeff Lemire run, but there was a similar choice made to what he does at the end. Mark had to leave behind Crawley who was taken by Anubis into the other void and in order to get him back he had to rescue the god's wife who had been locked down there. Normally in myth, Tarawet didn't really have anything to do with this, but they've kind of combined her with being a guide and also a judge. Now this could also lead into the gods that we saw trapped at the start of episode 4 and potentially she's having to do both jobs because they're imprisoned. A version of this that's more in line with how it appeared in mythology also showed up in the comics, namely Halstrom, son of Satan. This appeared more like what we typically see in the legends, with Anubis being the one who judged and there was Amit ready to eat your heart out if your soul was heavier than a feather. Anubis does however appear on the scale itself, but the character is completely missing from the entry. Now she says that they have to show each other the truth before they reach the field of reeds. Episode 1 also had mention of this when the girl talked about him getting rejected from the field of reeds, potentially setting this up. And did it suck for you? Getting rejected from the field of reeds? Well that don't make sense, because I'm not dead, am I? Stevie. Am I? Steven questioned whether he was dead, and yeah, really nice bit of foreshadowing that shows they're, they're all still in the asylum, I'm telling you, they're all still in the asylum. Now, they want to break out and save Layla, but they must confront their past first and the trauma that got them there. We get flashes of the bathroom fight, the night sky being turned back and also another QR code. If you've been keeping up with the series, then you'll know that you get a free comic if you scan these and grabbing this one takes you to Moon Knight issue 1 from 1980. Beside this door, we see a version of the character standing drinking with a taxi in the background. I did think this might be Jake, but it's revealed to be Mark, who can't bear the weight on his soul. Later it's revealed that this is his mother's shiver, which is the period of mourning that comes after a Jewish funeral. I think it's sort of the equivalent to a wake, but gonna be honest, I'm not fully versed up on this stuff and I don't want to seem disrespectful, so if it's got a different name, please leave the correction in the comments below, and I apologise, yeah? Now they end up entering a cafe filled with dead bodies, and these are revealed to be Mark's victims. Now there were slight hints to these bodies being in this hospital, if it is a hospital, all the way back in episode 2 in Harrow's office. Conchu took out these people for being predators, murderers and people who didn't hit the thumbs up button and clearly it weighs on Mark's soul. However, after confronting them, the scales start to balance out a bit. Now there's a lovely little detail here as well, with one of the corpses that has a cap that says Odin, who is also dead. Yay! Now the piece is broken when a mysterious child shows up, who leads Steven into Mark's past. At this point we catch his mother running the barbecue and also meet his little brother Roro. This is clearly Randall Spectre, 
who you'll be well aware of if you're familiar with the comics. Like his brother, he joined the CIA and became a cold-blooded assassin. Whereas Mark became Moon Knight, Randall ended up becoming the villain Hatchet Man before he turned into Shadow Knight. He's a terrifying character and there is potential that he shows up down the line as a villain in the future, even with the death scene. I think it would be a big twist to have him come back and with it being the thing that started to fracture Mark's mind, it's a very cool twist. Now we also have him drawing a goldfish with one fin, which Steven of course kept as a pet. Mark also says the phrase, later skaters, to say goodbye, which Steven of course said in episode 1. Later skaters, a wild crocodile. Anyway, sorry I missed you mum, uh, I'll try again tomorrow. Later skaters. Now we did theorise that Steven's mother was dead and we get it confirmed in this entry. Though Layla brought her up in episode 2, it's clear Mark didn't tell her what really happened in order to seem somewhat normal. The postcards were also likely sent from him and we did actually see them up at Steven's work at one point in the first episode. It's something we theorised all the way back then and hey, though we've had some misses, nice to get one right, shabow. Now Steven being nice to her on the phone could very much be Mark trying to repair the guilt that he felt over causing his brother's death, which he blames him for. Together they play as Dr. Grant and Rossa, the characters we met in last week's Tomb Buster. Steven also steps on the skeleton of a hummingbird, which has a similar head to Conchu. This of course is what one of the patients drew last week, and as I've been saying, It's all connected. Now at this point we see the waterfall and his brother sadly dies after the cave they're in floods. Elsewhere Mark visits the memory of his brother Shiver, which leans heavily into his Jewish heritage. In the comics it was his father's, but I do appreciate the changeup, which kind of leads into his relationship with his mother being destroyed. Really nice getting in this episode as they had kind of shied away from it throughout most of the series, though we did see a star of David Necklace on the character at the end of episode 2. We can see this chain around Steven's neck in this entry as well, and it's such an important aspect of the character that I'm glad they acknowledged it. It's clear that Mark's mother Wendy completely shuts down emotionally after the death of his brother, and she avoided most of his birthdays. She sank into a deep depression, started drinking heavily, and it all kind of leads into why Mark formed his DID. This is something that is created from childhood trauma, and it's really heartbreaking watching all these scenes. Mark ends up leaving, and we cut to the desert to see one of the darkest parts of his life. Now in the comics, Mark was part of the Marines, but after he was kicked out, he ended up becoming a mercenary. Mark partnered up with another merc called Ralph Bushman who wore Death's head tattooed over his face to terrify those he was going into battle with. Bushman was a complete psychopath and the two went together to a dig site that had unearthed the temple for the moon god Khonshu. Realising he could get rich if he stole all the jewels, he ended up killing all the archaeologists there and just left behind the door of the head one who was Marlene. Now Mark tried to stop this but Bushman ended up beating him so badly that he was left in hypocritical condition because Tarawet wasn't there. A hypocritical sh joke. Anyway, Marlene and the locals in the area that worship the god took Mark before the shrine and after he made a deal with Conchu to become his avatar on Earth, he ended up transforming into Moon Knight. Now, whereas here we see Mark actually transform into the character like he has in the show, in the comics he just grabbed the cloak off the statue and put it around him. Moon Knight very much to start off as a pretty straightforward character that was basically just Batman, but don't tell people I said that. But over the years, they've kind of added in more of the supernatural stuff to flesh him out a lot and distance him from that. Conchu himself has also gone through several redesigns as well, and initially he just started off as a normal statue like what we see here, which kind of evolved into the bird head. Egyptian gods typically tend to have animal traits to them, so I can kind of see why they decided to change things up. Moon Knight went and got revenge on Bushman, and the pair have had many battles over the years. Mark even cut his face off at one point, which brought a whole new meaning to the skull tattoo that he of course has. Now Bushman gets mentioned in this entry, so this could possibly set up him showing up fully at some point in an upcoming show or film. Every time I bring a Oscar Isaac returning, someone in the comments points out that he said this is a one and done, but meh, still lots of stories to tell and I doubt he'd turn it down if Mickey showed up to the house with one million dollars cash, cool hard cash one million. Now amongst this area, we catch Layla's father who's wearing a scarlet scarf much like what Harrow said he had on in episode 4. We can also see the scarab markings on it and this clearly weighs heavily on Mark's soul. Now it is possible that they're setting Layla up to become the scarlet scarab. Throughout the series, she's been referred to as one at several points due to the nickname that her father gave her as a child. I wonder what your father would think of his little scarab now. Bronte Sawyer. My little scarab. Isn't that what your father used to call you? Beyond this though, Layla's full name is Layla Abdullah Al-Fawli and the Scarlet Scarab in the comics is called Abdul Fowl. 
In the hospital, she also has a thimble on her finger, which when we zoom in, has a little scarlet scarab on it. In the comics, he fought against Captain America and co, and it is possible that Layla might even end up taking the mantle come the end of the show. Now together, they walk towards the Temple of Khonshu, which is ripped right out of the comics. This is even down to the way it's lit, but they change up the moon from a full one to a crescent one, so it's more in line with Moon Knight's symbol. Originally, though Mark was carried before the shrine, in the Jeff Lemire run, they change it up so that he crawled towards it, which this episode recaptures perfectly. Before he ends his life, Khonshu calls out to him, and the pair make a deal. Mark very much sells his soul, and this is somewhat a deal with the devil. The bird from before could tease that he's been with him since a kid, and who knows, his control of the elements could have meant that he killed his brother. Might be a big reveal next week, and that's the shortest ever theory time, theory time, theory time, theory time. Now they travel back to the boat, and we see purple glows raining down. This pulls from the dark dimension, and it signals that Harrow is freeing Omit, who is condemning souls en masse. Tarouette starts to steer towards the gate of Osiris, and the pair try desperately to balance out the scales. Mark gets heated and refuses to go back, which is when we cut back to Harrow's office in a complete mind f again. Now he says that they can't involuntarily sedate patients, but hey, I seen it. With his Ned Flanders moustache, he ponder de Leonders whether Mark created Stephen to hide from all the horrors he committed, or if Stephen created Mark to punish the world for their mother's actions. After looking at his reflection in a glass of water, we cut to the two Tomb Buster figures. This is done without going through the doorways, and I know I'll keep banging on about this theory, yeah? But it might, it might just be imagining the whole thing, but I'll, I'll move on. Now they lean heavily into the comics at this point as well, and Mark's room is extremely similar to how it is in the source material. You can also catch the framed image of the goldfish, and we learn that his mother is very much perceived as having another personality by Mark. He says she's not his mother, and she brutally beats and abuses him, which is absolutely heartbreaking. He shifts into Stephen's body in front of the mirror in order to hide himself from his mother, and we see not only the scales, but also a poster for Tomb Buster. In the comics, this was an Indiana Jones one, but they clearly changed it up to show why he adopted the Stephen Grant persona. At this point, Stephen shifts to the office, and what a f***ing mind f Now, I don't think anyone can 100% confirm what's real and what's not, which I really love. Harrow states that after his mother passed that they checked into the hospital, and he calls Dylan, which is the name of the girl that Stephen organised a date with in episode 1. She gets his mother's number, but before they even speak, he accepts her death, and we cut to her shiver. We learn that this is when their lives started bleeding together, and Stephen tells him it wasn't his fault, which kinda helps the character's soul. They reach the gates, but they're closed, and with the scales being unbalanced, they're unable to open up. Thus, the dead start to climb aboard and attack them, which is when Stephen throws himself and he's sent overboard. Stephen dies in the dunes, which balances the scales, and Mark is taken to the Field of Reeds. Over the top of this, we hear the song Mass Ala del Sol, which translates to Somewhere Over the Sun. Here Mark remains, which closes out the episode. Now as for next week, I think that things are going to go a bit by the numbers, because hey, it's a Disney Plus show, and outside of Loki, they've all kind of wrapped up things in a pretty standard way. From the teasers, we have shots of Moon Knight and Harrow jumping towards one another whilst the moon is full, which sort of brings things full circle from how it was in the Jackal chase. Now I think that Mark will meet another avatar here, and after he escapes, he'll make it back to the surface. Like I said earlier, I do think that Steven will be back in some form or another, and they might even get Jake involved too, as he's been teased at so heavily. They kinda need the trifecta to pull it off, and Layla is gonna be instrumental in getting Khonshu and then resurrecting Mark. He's done this so many times in the comics before, and due to the suit's regenerative qualities, it could be what brings him back from the brink after the god is freed. Huge shout out to add MCU Geek the on Twitter for going back and forth with me over these theories, and in the end, I can see him defeating Harrow, embracing all the personas in his life, and getting the girl. Now, I do think that they might do something to kind of tease that this is all still in his head, and potentially they might end on either the B-22 bingo ball, or something like the Moon Knight figure. I really think they'll go ambiguous with it so we can argue forever until we find something to do with our meaningless lives, but as we mentioned earlier, there are a lot of clues that this whole thing's in Mark's head. I kind of hope they end like that just to keep us talking about the show, but there's also the possibility that they might tease the Midnight Suns. Again, Isaac hasn't confirmed that he's coming back, but when you have Dane Whitman and Blade in one part of London at a museum, it makes sense to get the other characters in the city involved with them. In case you don't know, they're basically a team that fights supernatural beings in the Marvel Universe, and we could also get characters like Ghost Rider involved with them too. Lots of things to look forward to, and the series just feels like it's building up really well and kind of capitalising on a lot of comics and interesting aspects of Moon Knight's history to tell us a rich story. I will of course be back next week, and sorry for being a bit late on the breakdown today. 
really want to apologize if you set up refreshing youtube all day for when i've dropped the video which thanks a lot but uh yeah never never rely on kevin spoilers he's not a good guy Give me video you'll get your video when you fix this damn door now as some of you know that's because marvel only gave out the first four episodes in advance so kind of rolling with it today instead of just watching the episode on a friday and putting stuff together throughout the weekend and the weekdays anyway i hope you enjoyed what was put out Thumbs up is much appreciated, and I hope to see you back next week. We are in a competition right now, we're giving away 3 copies of Spider-Man No Way Home on the 15th of May, and all you have to do to be on with a chance of winning is like the video, make sure you subscribe with notifications on, and drop a comment below with your thoughts on the episode. We pick the comments at random at the end of the month, and the winners of the last one are on screen right now, so if that's you, then message me on Twitter at Heavy Spoilers. Now if you want to watch a breakdown of all the evidence in the series to show that it's in Mark's head, then that'll be linked on screen right now. Really good video, put a lot of time into it. And yeah, you j you're not doing anything else, are you? J go check it out. So all, all the other YouTubers, they, they might not have uploaded their breakdown yet. So uh, yeah, you stuck with me for now. And I appreciate that, that you are stuck with me and that you chose me. I love you and I'll see you next week. Take care. Peace.